Good morning. My name is Margaret Hellard from the Burnett Institute. And thank you for, to the organisers for the opportunity to present at the conference um, today. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, prior to starting, I'd like to acknowledge that I am doing this presentation by video from the land of the uh, Bar Barabinub people in the Otways in Australia. I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Today, I'm presenting on the elimination of hepatitis C in Australia and the importance of engaging with prisoners. Um, in terms of disclosures, they're here. Um, probably a key to note is that I receive um, funding from Gilead Sciences and Abdi for investigator-initiated research. I'd also like to acknowledge that obviously I don't do this work all on my own and there's many collaborators which I will uh, highlight at the end of the presentation, but in particular um, uh, my team at the Burnett Institute, uh, Mark Stuvay who leads the Justice Health Program, Alex Thompson with whom I collaborate uh, at St Vincent's, as well as Andrew Lloyd in Sydney, Darren Russell and others. The overview of today's presentation, I'm going to talk about hepatitis C elimination globally because we need to think about the treatment of prisoners in that context. The importance of treating people who inject drugs, the importance of treating prisoners and the role of the hepatitis in, in Australia of the hepatitis C elimination response and the importance of prisons in that. And then going to sort of speak a little bit more specifically, which is the jurisdiction that I come from, which is in Victoria in Australia. Um, Victoria's uh, statewide hepatitis program. I'm also going to touch on a couple of other important programs uh, running throughout Australia because there's some terrific work being done by people. So if we think about hepatitis C, I always say, why do we care? And viral hepatitis is the second biggest annual killer globally, and hepatitis C is responsible for many, many deaths globally. And it's very common infection throughout the world. And for many places, hepatitis B predominantly impacts on people who inject drugs. In not all countries, but in, in many countries, it's the leading cause of, of, uh, the, of infection and transmission. And in other countries, even if it's not a leading cause, it plays a substantial role. A number of years ago now, back in 2015, the World Health Organization has set targets for reducing um, hepatitis C infections. So to stop new infections, but also importantly, to stop deaths. And so these are really incredibly important targets that we're all aiming for. Um, by 2030 to basically um, to reduce the impact of, of hepatitis C or hepatitis C elimination as a public health threat. To achieve these targets, we need to diagnose people with hepatitis C and we need to treat people with chronic hepatitis C. And very, very importantly as well, we need to have really quality harm reduction programs to stop new infections amongst people who inject drugs and that we need to improve coverage. Sometimes there was no mention in, in the, the targets of opiate substitution therapy, but in my view, that goes hand in hand in the harm reduction program. So why do we think hepatitis C elimination is achievable? As most people in this audience will absolutely know, it's because we had a game changing curative treatments. Extraordinary, and I think it's really easy for us to become complacent and not marvel and remember to marvel at the enormous impact that these direct acting antiviral therapies have had on the community and on our work, but so many people can be cured of a disease that can cause them significant health issues and, and, and lead to their death through, through hepatocellular cancer, a carcinoma and, and uh, liver failure. So extraordinary impact. As well, treating people early in their infection can stop um, ongoing transmission. Hence the importance of treating people who inject drugs. Work by Peter Vickerman and Natasha Martin back in 2012 was the first piece of work or model that showed that elimination of hepatitis C was indeed possible and that you didn't have to treat everybody immediately. But if you treated a certain number of people who injected drugs every year, um, that you could begin to then impact on disease prevalence, which is a really important piece of work. It was for me at least a light bulb moment that I thought, yep, we can actually achieve elimination. Work by myself and others in my group also noted that people don't inject on their own, but within networks. And if we could impose on the network and not just treat the individual, but treat their injecting partners, we can have really great bang for our buck in terms of stopping the ongoing transmission of infection. So not only do we need to treat people who inject drugs because it stops the ongoing transmission of virus, but if we treat them and their injecting network, we can have a really big impact on community transmission and causing the incidence of infection to drop. So stop those new infections a really important concept. And really important to understand that this does not then, it's not one thing or another, that you can do both treat people who inject drugs um, and stop ongoing transmission, 
and also treat people with significant liver disease to stop deaths and you achieve these things. And this work by, by Nick Scott from my group clearly showed that you could do both um, and get great bang for your buck by treating both people who injected drugs and treating um, people with significant liver disease and that you would achieve those WHO targets without having to treat too, too many people every year. So this worked out to be about treating about 10,000 people or so a year. Um, about half of those people who injected drugs, half of those people with significant liver disease um, would help us in Australia to achieve our targets. And indeed, with that in mind, one of the great things that happened in Australia um, is that hepatitis C treatment was made available to everybody. It was put on our um, public health system, which meant that for a relatively low cost for the actual patient, you could get access to treatment. And prescribing has really shot up um, through, particularly when the drugs were first put onto the PBS scheme or that public scheme in 2016. And we've had reasonable levels of treatment since, although obviously we're all concerned about the, the, the overall fall and then the impact of COVID on this. But importantly, in that um, scale up of treatment, work um, that has been done um, by the Burnett and Kirby Institute and others through our surveillance systems that we've set up in Australia show that hepatitis C incidence, importantly, is beginning to reduce. And this is a slide here showing the incidence of primary hepatitis C infections among people that are tested at access primary clinics who tested hepatitis C antibody test negative less than two years ago. And as you can see, the incidence of hepatitis C is falling. So that's a really important thing because not every country has the ability to show that their um, treatment programs, their universal health systems for treating everybody with hepatitis C is leading to a decline in hepatitis C incidence. But we're able to show this, and predominantly the people accessing these clinics, a large proportion of them, though not all, are people who inject drugs. So that's sort of suggestive of, of great success there. So what's, why treat prisoners? What is the importance of treating prisoners? Well, importantly, and unfortunately, the great overlap um, for, for many prisoners is they have many chronic health issues and our tendency is unfortunately to incarcerate people for these issues rather than to take a, a health approach, be that mental health, be that general wellbeing, be it many things and injecting drug use is also one of those things. So there's a great overlap between um, people who inject drugs and, and, having, and prisoners and having a history of having um, a history of injecting drug use. So injecting drug use and incarceration, criminalisation laws concentrate people who inject drugs in the prison setting. So if you think about what you're doing, is if, you're, if you're really wanting to say, how will I ensure that a disease can transmit within a population, I'll bring all of that population into one place. And not only that, I'll do it in a way where I actually limit their access to health and harm reduction services and disrupt their own social networks. So it's really, in a way, we're creating a, an environment where risk goes up. So prison is a risk environment, where we concentrate, amplify the ability for the virus to be transmitted. But also, if we really decide we want to do something, it provides an opportunity. And I think this is one of the things that I would say is that it's, it's unfortunate that we want to incarcerate so many people who inject drugs rather than manage it as a health issue. But it does provide an opportunity for underutilisation to re-engage people in care diagnosis to people who may not be aware that they're infected to start to test them and treat. So that provides an opportunity as well. Globally, estimated that 15.1% of prison population have hepatitis C. There's a high prevalence in, of people, as I've said before, people who are in prison who have a history of injecting drug use. Um, there's also a disproportionate number who have hepatitis B. So there's a lot of things that we could do if we go, well, let's utilise the prison system. Um, and this is just a, a slide by Kate Dolan, which I was involved with, which is showing the global prevalence of hepatitis C. So this is an issue globally. It's not just in, in a few countries. It's both in high and low and middle income countries. So with this in mind, when, when Australia was setting up for its hepatitis C treatment and universal coverage and saying we're going to try and aim to treat all, very importantly, the health minister at the time, um, Minister Lee, made a decision that treatment would be available, not just in the community, but for prisoners. And this was vitally important um, because it, in terms of the system to enable this, this low cost treatment or treatment to be low cost to all prisoners. As you can see here, work by Sarah Lani um, from the Kirby Institute and the University of New South Wales at the time, um, showed that there was an overlap between, as I said, in Australia, between people who inject drugs and prisoners in Australia. So if we really wanted to have traction we need to think of this as a key population that we need to work with. It's just further information about the Australian health system, about 
got multiple prisons in multiple jurisdictions, um, the predominant number of male, and as I said, many have a history of injecting drug use and this over-representation with an estimated 56% of people who inject drugs in prison entrance with hepatitis C. So really too, too much disease. There. So as I said, a really important decision was made um, in 2016, along with this universal access for everybody in the community with chronic hepatitis B, so that you could get the treatment, regardless of disease stage, regardless whether you had a history of injecting drug use, that this treatment was also to be available in the prison system. So we had unrestricted access to, to heavily government subsidised DAAs. And people in custodial settings were identified as being a priority population in our national hepatitis C strategy. And there was this opportunity for upscaling and prevention. So a number of things. At the same time, we recognised that there were some issues that we needed to keep on thinking about, and I think still do need to keep on thinking about, including the post-release linkage. So if somebody was to start treatment in prison, how do we ensure that they're linked to care when they're released to freedom? And we know um, from work done by a number of people, both in Australia and globally, um, that the biggest risk for a prisoner in terms of their health overall is that period immediately post-release. And it's the thing that we need to think about, not just for hepatitis C, for mental health, drug overdose, suicide prevention, all sorts of things. So we've got this issue of post-release linkage and continuity of care. Reinfection prevention, because in prisons in Australia, we don't have needle and syringe programs, um, despite the evidence suggesting globally that these are highly effective and safe. Education and awareness, and also the stigma and fear of being identified as having hepatitis C or being an injecting drug user. So we continue to have, both in Australia and I suspect globally, a this you know, a punitive approach to injecting drug use. So many prisoners are fearful that if they're identified as having a history of injecting drug use, this could impact on how they're managed within the prison. So in Australia, in an effort to really um, have a cohesive approach to this work being led by Andrew Lloyd, Alex Thompson, myself and others, have set up a national prisons hepatitis network. Um, and we've had regular workshops where people talk about what's going on within their jurisdictions. And, and the idea of this network is to facilitate information exchange, to, to try and help develop a health infrastructure within the justice system around hepatitis C testing and treatment. Because this is really important that we have this cohesive approach so that no one, like no, no prison and no jurisdiction is left behind. To support the development of data capture systems to measure and test treatment rates in the prisons nationally. This is really important. Having data helps you know where you're coming from and where you're going to, whether you're being successful, what components are being successful, and how can we encourage that to occur across the jurisdictions. And to facilitate health service research to drive policy making for a scale up of hepatitis C treatment in prisons. So how do, again, how do we all help each other? How do we help each other work with really complex, uh, really what I'd call the complex interaction of the justice health system where um, the focus for many people is on keeping somebody incarcerated and the health system where your focus is on trying to improve health and wellbeing and when it's in a prison situation, how do you make that work and work uh, effectively? So we are making progress in Australia. In 2019, it was estimated that over 3,000 uh, hepatitis C treatment episodes were commenced um, across Australia in all jurisdictions. That was thought to be about 29% of all of the treatments that were offered in Australia in 2019. In various jurisdictions, the proportion of DAA initiations in the prison, it's, there's a, there is a great range. And in part that highlights the importance of having a national approach, but also it, it can highlight differences in the nature of the, the, the justice system in the prison, individual prisons. So there's also a wide range of, of the, the proportion of people being treated from two to 40% reflecting differences in the characteristics of different prisons. Here's some work which really, when we look across at the number of an estimated proportion of individuals who initiated treatment in the community compared to the, the justice system. And as you can see, it varies across jurisdictions, but it, it importantly shows that all jurisdictions, there is some treatment going on, but that actually it's making a substantial, if you think about Australia's elimination efforts, where we need to treat at least probably 10 to 15,000 people annually um, for hepatitis C, and we need a significant proportion of those if we want to stop that early transmission, um, being people who currently inject drugs, then the prison system is making a substantial um, kind of contribution to ensuring that we're number one, keeping up our overall treatment numbers, and then number two, we're treating that key group to stop transmission, namely people who inject drugs. 
As well, treatment alone is not the only important thing. It's really important we have um, prevention services and this work recently by um, uh, Andrew Lloyd and his team uh, really highlights the importance of the combination of treatment combined with harm reduction, both OST and needle and syringe programs. The I'm going to speak specifically in a little bit more detail about um, an example of a, 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 a a statewide hepatitis program that's being undertaken in Victoria. Alex Thompson from St Vincent's Hospital leads this work. Um, Tim Pak Paluka did this research as part of his PhD, but you'll see there's a number of people named on this at the beginning, some you know, fabulous nurses, Lucy McDonald, Andy Craig, and others who really um, run this, this service and, and do all, what I'll call the hard work, along with, with um, Alex, David and Jess, David Eisen and Jess Howe, who are the clinicians supporting the work. So it's a really fabulous statewide program. And essentially, it's trying to take a public health, it's trying to talk about what's that public health opportunity that you can have. Um, and so how do we go, um, we've got this, these fabulous treatments, we've got people who are incarcerated, many of them who are hepatitis C infected, how do we get treatment out to them? So how do we scale up? And hepatitis, so, so that's what this whole, um, plan is about, and as you can see from the slide there, there's multiple prisons across the, uh, or correctional facilities across, across Victoria in terms of jurisdictions. So there's barriers to hepatitis C treatment, as I alluded to earlier, short sentences, frequent transfers between prisons. Um, initially, when they started this program, interferon was an issue, though it's not obviously no longer, and also limited specialist access, because you have lockdowns and things. So how do you actually increase engagement? So they took a nurse-led approach um, with these two full-time nurses, had protocols, had portable fibre scans, and essentially they went around to the prisons. And importantly, I think the sort of the take-home message I would want to say from this is that a lot of the time, these prisoners never, ever saw a clinician. The nurses would do the assessment, do the workup, do all of the work to assess whether the person was suitable and, uh, and able to have treatment. And then they would provide the, the clinicians with information about that. But really only if it was a complex patient would, would there necessarily be a, a telehealth consultation um, or, um, and, and very rarely was there a need for face-to-face. -face. So this is really important because it meant that prisoners could be treated in the prison that they were located in and weren't having to transfer between prisons, which is something that prisoners don't like. It meant that they could increase capacity because the nurses could get out to, to lots of places. So it was a really been a, a very successful system. Um, and as you can see here, Tim did some work on, on who was being treated. This is sort of early data. Um, and, and really, um, this to sort of say, is, is this model, are we actually getting the outcomes we need? There's a lot more detail and you can certainly look at the manuscript. But um, I think the key thing I wanted to highlight here is that in, in this, prisoner characteristics is a significant proportion of them had a history of drug use and injecting drug use. So this is a complex group of people that are being treated that people are often really worried about. So we've got people who are in prison with histories of injecting drug use. But they've got a lot of other stuff going on as well. And you can see there a significant um, level of, of co comorbid psychiatric illness. So as I said, a complex patient group. Um, but of those 416, 364 completed treatment uh, and were PCR negative at the end of treatment. Um, and there were some though we didn't have the final test available and prisons transferred and the like. But only a small number were still PCR positive. So that's a really impressive outcome if you think about it. And if you sort of look at, not all of the prisoners had SVR12 results available because not everybody did that. But we know that most vast majority of people who are successfully um, PCR negative at the end of treatment remain um, uh, PCR negative at, at SVR12 time period. So it's a really uh, important and, and impressive outcome. Again, we need to be mindful that there is the issue of reinfection and, and, and does that reinfection occur uh, within the prison? And, and certainly there's evidence of that occurring in some jurisdictions in Australia or when the person, because of this rapid turnaround that you're only in prison for a short period of time, then you, you leave prison and then you're back in again. And people often get really concerned about this issue of, of reinfection, um, this, the issue of reinfection. But the reality is, if we are not getting some reinfection, we're not treating the right people because we're not treating people who currently inject drugs. So we won't be stopping the ongoing transmission. Of the 11, I just wanted to highlight that there were some relapses with one reinfection. But as I said, just keep treating. 
So as I said, the nurse-led model of care has been really, really effective as an approach. It saves much less money than having clinicians go out there, but also is much more practical in terms of getting to people. And I would highly recommend it to people in terms of if you're thinking about your structures. Another place I just want to highlight is Lotus Glen Correctional Facility um, up in, in New Cairns in Queensland, who have had a highly successful program. Again, complex population, high level of people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, but really had a very focused thing of trying to get the prison hepatitis C free and have been really successful in treating large numbers of people and achieving this. Again, reinfection remains an issue. There's an outbreak happens um, at the moment, you know, sort of a reinfection events. But again, it just shows you need to keep on it, but it's a really important approach. So what can we do in future directions to make it that we're even easier to treat prisoners? So first of all, I would be saying that you need to have these innovative nurse-led models. You need to try to monitor within reason, but not make it your whole focus. We need to try and make testing as simple as possible. We also need to think about when a prisoner has started treatment, what is the best and most effective linkage to care? We know that it can be successful in doing that. Some work, again, by Tim Papaluka is increasingly showing that you can do this linkage, but it's really important. It has to be an effort. It doesn't happen by chance. I think that would be probably the thing I would be saying with hepatitis C linkage of prisoners coming out of prison. Things don't happen by chance, and it's really important, though, to try and do that follow-up and be very successful. We need to remove any barriers we can possibly think of to engage in the community, to have one-stop shops, within the prisons to have one-stop shops and those things. We also need to simplify it. You don't need to have a fibre scan. Mostly you can have it a pre. So simplify, simplify, simplify. We need to engage with the community, both the external community outside of prisons, impacted on drug user groups, hepatitis C foundations, but also within the prisons. It needs to be multi-pronged. So in conclusion, hepatitis C elimination is ambitious and achievable, but it's not going to happen by chance. We need to Focused, sustained approach. It takes the individual country's epidemiology into account. It needs to ensure nobody's left behind. For many countries, this means you need to be treating people who inject drugs and prisoners. Treatment alone is, is not just the only thing. We need prevention, testing and systems change. And also one day, hopefully, an effective vaccine. Importantly as well, stigma and discrimination is a really key issue within hepatitis C and why we will fail to achieve elimination. And we need to get rid of it. We need to have sensible, evidence-based drug policy. I'd like to thank and acknowledge many people who have contributed to this work. Thank you very much. <laughs>